Well, good morning, everyone, and it's uh, nice to be here. Thank you for those that uh, asked me to preach here and for those that gave permission for me to do so. It's always a privilege to be able to speak the Word of God. Thank you for the prayer this morning that mentioned uh, coming to the foot of the cross. The story is going to start a long way from the foot of the cross, but eventually that's where we're going to end up. And uh, I encourage you to listen to uh, what I have to say this morning. Thank you for uh, fixing up this mic for me, because I don't need to be standing here all of the service. Give me the freedom to move around a little bit. The story this morning, uh, as you might have already guessed, is the story of Zacchaeus. Thank you, kids, for singing that song this morning. Back home in Fielding, uh, where I normally worship, I lead out in the junior primary division in the Sabbath school. And uh, that's a position that I have come to enjoy over these last few years. And that's become my ministry probably for the last five years in the primary junior Sabbath school. And we have some there that won't move out. They get to 13 and they still want to stay. So they must be learning something there. <clears throat> Our story this morning starts from a couple of young parents. And they look down at the little bundle of joy in their hands and they count all his fingers and his toes, and he has two legs and two arms, and he's absolutely perfect. And they thank God for the gift that, they, that he has given to them. And if there was anything wrong with him that they could, that they could determine, uh, was probably that he was quite small. But being parents, uh, very new parents, they thought perhaps all babies were that small. And so they named him Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was small, but they quickly learned that he was, he was a very bright boy. He picked up things very quickly. And it wasn't long before he was talking and walking, seemingly in advance of other kids his own age, but always he was small. And little Zacchaeus couldn't wait till he went to school. They lived in a little village just south of Jericho, a village that was quite small but big enough to have a synagogue in it. And because it had a synagogue in the village, they had a resident rabbi. And every Jewish boy was required to learn to read and write. Girls, not so, but the males were. And so when Zacchaeus got to the age that he could go to school, he was sent off to the local synagogue and taught by the local rabbi. <coughs> Zacchaeus loved to learn, and he learned quickly. He learned to read and write. He learned to do basic mathematics. And in particular, he learned history, not general history, but history concerned with the nation of Israel. Starting off with Abraham, he quickly learned that he was very important because he was a son of Abraham. They continued on down the line where, where Moses, was, uh, Moses was a great leader and how God with a mighty hand pulled his people out of Egypt. He learned about the great days of Israel when they had King David and King Solomon, and when those kings ruled a large amount of land there in the Middle East. Also learned about the mistakes the children of Israel made and how they left and worshipped other gods and how God punished them for it. He also learned about the law and the importance of that. He learned about the great temple that was up there in Jerusalem and all the services that were associated with that and and how you would take a lamb there and you would kill a lamb and, and the blood of it would somehow forgive the sins and the things that you had done wrong. And how one day there would come a Messiah and he would rid them, rid them of those wicked and hated Romans that now ruled their country. School was an amazing place for Zacchaeus. And he would have loved every minute of it except there was one person there that made his days unhappy. His name was Benjamin. Son of Judah, just lived down the way from where Zacchaeus lived. He was a bigger boy, and he was a bully. And as bullies always do, they pick on the little kids. And Zacchaeus can remember back to those days how they were made unpleasant by the actions of Benjamin the bully. And so it was with some regret, but pleasure as well, that Zacchaeus left school. And at the age of 12, he was now considered a young adult. 
Two things happened when a boy, a Jewish boy, turned 12. Firstly, he had to start to work. He had to learn to do something. It might be like the great apostle Paul. Perhaps he had to learn how to be a tent maker. It might be like Jesus himself. He had to learn to be a carpenter, joiner. Whatever it might be, he had to start his apprenticeship at the age of 12. There was something else that he had to do that he was now able to do, and that was he could go to the Passover. That was always, of course, up in Jerusalem. He'd never been to Jerusalem, although it was not all that far away. They would just walk to Jericho, which was only a few miles away, and then Jericho to Jerusalem was only 15 miles away. But being a young boy and having to walk, he'd never been there. And he couldn't wait until Passover approached because he would, for the first time, go with his dad up to Jerusalem. The day came, and they got up early that morning, and they walked across to Jericho, as I said, was not far away, and they had to do the walk in a day. Jericho to Jerusalem was a long, hard trip. 15 miles, and of course none of us here probably walk 15 miles in an ordinary day, unless you're training for some marathon or something like that. But in those days, that wasn't all that big a distance. But this was made the more difficult because Jericho is 800 feet below sea level, Jerusalem is 2,400 feet above sea level. So it was a climb of 15 miles, climbing over 3,000 feet. They made their way across to Jericho where groups were gathering, other people were making the same journey this day, and they travelled in large groups because it was a dangerous road. Jericho to Jerusalem was a dangerous road. Robbers and highwaymen lived amongst the rugged terrain there. And they waited till the, their group was big enough and they all went together and they made their way as the day progressed. Eventually they got to a little town called Bethany. And then as they continued, that meant they were getting close to Jerusalem once they reached Bethany, only two miles to go. They went through another little town called Bethphage. And as they rounded the corner of Bethphage, here they could look out across the valley and there was Jerusalem. The beautiful temple which he had heard so much about. The other beautification programs that King Herod had started were there too, the king's palace. And they could see the shimmering light of the evening, of the afternoon sun, shimmering on that beautiful white stone temple. Zacchaeus was extremely excited. There were hundreds and thousands of people there. In fact, Josephus tells us that on some Passovers, up to two and a half million people crowded into Jerusalem. Now, Josephus sometimes exaggerated things. But nonetheless, we know that in AD 70, when the Romans took Jerusalem, one million Jews died in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem in the old days was not all that big. About two kilometres long, one, one and a half kilometres wide, and they squeezed millions of people into that city. Of course, there was not enough accommodation for everybody. Many of them lived for those few days outside the city gates, built themselves little shelters. Zacchaeus and his dad went to the temple service, and Zacchaeus watched as their lamb was killed as their lamb's blood was collected, and as their family sins were atoned for. Zacchaeus couldn't quite work out how the lamb was going to be the Messiah because he thought the Messiah wasn't going to die and was going to grow to be a great military man. He had trouble working that one out. But nonetheless, uh, he went back home, and every year after that, he went up to the temple. The years rolled by, and Zacchaeus eventually decided he wanted to leave his little village. And with his father's permission, he left and went to Jericho. He wanted to venture out into the world a little bit more. And he wondered what work he might do in Jericho. He wasn't a big man, but he was a smart man. And he decided that he would become a merchant. He would buy and sell goods. Jericho was right on a, on a trade route. And there was lots of merchandise that came through Jericho. And uh, he would buy in goods and sell them and make a profit. He was very successful. And it didn't take too many years before Zacchaeus became quite a wealthy man. And one day a Roman official sidled up to him and said, Zacchaeus, Jericho is becoming a wealthy place. There's a lot of trade coming through here. We'd like you to consider something. Just at this point, I'd like to tell you what Jericho was like in these days. This wasn't the same Jericho that Joshua had conquered a thousand years before. 
that was still down the road a little bit further. It had been rebuilt to some extent, and some people still live there, but most of the people had shifted down to the new Jericho that the Romans had built. They had built it as an administrative centre for themselves, uh, particularly to collect taxes and uh, for military purposes, and they built a nice new city there. It was a great place for farmers. Below sea level had a sub-tropical sub, uh, climate, Subtropical fruit grew there. Not much rainfall, but the ground was naturally watered from springs that came from under the ground. Great crops grew there. Exotic fruit. Good climate. Lovely place to live compared to, say, Jerusalem that had extremes, cold and heat. And so because of that, lots of people liked to live there. The Romans were there. Farmers were there. Traders were there. And lots of priests lived there. A priest was required to give a certain number of days a year of service to the temple. And um, not everyone wanted to live in Jerusalem. Jericho was the place to live, and so a lot of them lived in Jericho, and they could just commute to Jerusalem when their time came. And so Zacchaeus, uh, living in this delightful place, doing well financially, approached by a Roman official would you like to become a tax collector, Zacchaeus? His immediate response was, he was horrified. Me become a tax collector, I'm a Jew. You see, there was a, there was a definite pecking order in the Jewish community. Priests, rulers, members of the Sanhedrin, they were at the top, ordinary citizens at the bottom, uh, in the middle rather, and at the bottom there was prostitutes, Lepers, Samaritans, Romans, and tax collectors. Tax collectors probably at the bottom of the heap. You see, not only were tax collectors, no one likes paying taxes, but this was worse. This was people working for the hated Romans, taking funds off their own people, and very often being dishonest about it into the bargain. Zacchaeus thought about that. One of, his, one of his great desires was to be wealthy. This would help his cause. But there were going to be some side effects. He would be instantly excommunicated from the local synagogue. He would no longer be able to go to church. He would no longer be able to go to the temple up there in Jerusalem to pass over or any of those other events. He would be excluded. He thought about that for a bit and... Uh, Consider that. He finally decided that there was quite a few things to consider, and he said to the Roman official that had sidled up to him, I'll have to think about this overnight. I can't make that decision right now. And he began thinking about other things. He would lose his friends. His good Jewish friends would have nothing to do with him. They would spit on his shadow on the ground as he walked past. He could no longer live in the section of Jericho where he now lived. He would have to shift. And he began weighing those things up. The synagogue was important to him, but he'd become a bit disillusioned of religion over the last few years, particularly the Jewish religion. He'd seen the way the priests behaved in his local city. He'd seen the way that they used to, in their hypocritical way, say one thing and do another. He saw their acts of dishonesty, particularly when he went up to, up to the temple in Jerusalem. He saw how they sold young lambs that were supposed to be perfect and they had blemishes, selling them for exorbitant prices. He noticed how they shortchanged people when they changed their currency from the ordinary Roman currency into temple currency. He saw some of the things they did in private and then preached something else at church. He hadn't been to Passover for a number of years and he thought, I could actually do away with that. I wouldn't miss that all that much. Yep, I could stop going to church. His friends, well, many of them were fair weather friends anyway. He was wealthy and they only hung around for his parties. And yep, he could shift from where he was. He had shifted into a better part of town. He would shift over to the Roman side and live with them. And so he went back to the official the next morning and said, yes, I'll take it. He had to pay for it. It was like a franchise, perhaps like a McDonald franchise. You didn't just become a tax collector. You had to buy the franchise. 
It cost Zacchaeus money, but he knew that he would be well rewarded. And so he set up his tax collecting booth there uh, in one of the gates of Jericho. People came through. Zacchaeus, because he'd been a merchant himself, could quickly evaluate the, 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 purchase, the price of the goods. He'd now turned, gone from poacher to gamekeeper. He knew how people tried to conceal the real value of the goods and he could find them out. <clears throat> and he would quickly evaluate the goods and uh, determine the amount of tax that had to be paid on those goods. He would add his legal commission and request the money. And this went well for the first few weeks. And one day as he was there on his desk writing up the records for the, uh, for the Roman government to check to make sure that he was giving them their fair amount, sitting there doing his work, not taking too much notice of the people that were coming through, a man came up, he called out, uh, name please, Benjamin, father's name, Judah, and he raised his eyes just quickly. He remembered that name. He even remembered that voice. And as their eyes, eyes connected, he quickly looked away, pretending that he never recognized who was standing in front of him. Benjamin, son of Judah from his childhood days. And quickly those thoughts of how that bully had treated him at school came into his mind. He got up out of his chair, pretending not to make, recognize him, quickly checked the goods that Benjamin was bringing through the gates of Jericho, went back down and sat at his desk, did some calculations, and determined in his mind that Benjamin owed him one silver bit. And he hesitated for a moment, and he suddenly blurted out, that'll be two silver bits. Benjamin, pretending not to, not to really care about this whole process, as Zacchaeus looked into his face, he saw his face visibly change colour to a bright red. He saw his fence clenched, he saw his fists clenched tight. And Benjamin took steps to him, why Zacchaeus, you little weasel, you... And he stopped mid-sentence as the two Roman guards that were there guarding, uh, that were there helping Zacchaeus suddenly dropped their spears, one pressing none too lightly against the neck of Benjamin and the other one pressing against his stomach. Suddenly Benjamin realized he was a split second away from death. You see, the Roman guards, they could care less about killing a Jew. All of them were troubled as far as they were concerned. Another one would not matter. No one would ask any questions. A Jewish trader not paying his tax, nothing would happen to them or to Zacchaeus. Suddenly Benjamin realized he'd overstepped the mark and he took two steps back. And the soldier said to him, you heard the man, two silver bits. Ben Benjamin put his hands beneath his robes and fumbled. His hands were now shaking. And he found two coins. He pulled them out and cautiously stepped forward and put them on the table. There are two feelings you can have when you do something wrong. One is instant regret. I wished I'd never done that. And wished you could take back the time and take back that action. And the other feeling is, I got away with that. I feel good I could do that again. The second feeling was the one that Zach has had. You see, at last, even though Benjamin was always going to be physically much stronger than Zach, Zach has realized that real power was not in your size, it was in money and position. And Zacchaeus now was the most powerful man. Benjamin was no longer the bully. Zacchaeus could now be the bully. And a sense of satisfaction came over him, and realization that Zacchaeus was becoming wealthy, but he could become even more wealthy. He knew the other ta tax collectors did this as well. He knew they overcharged. And at the end of the day, he took out two copper coins and gave one to each of the soldiers, greasing their palms well. They had effectively doubled their wages for the day, and he had an unsigned contract with his guards. They would assist him in future operations. Zacchaeus continued to grow wealthy until, again, a Roman official sidled up to Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, we have been observing what you are doing here. You are efficient, your records are good, you do your job well. We would like you to become chief tax collector 
in the whole of Jericho district. This was not a hard decision for Zacchaeus. He didn't have to consider much. It was only the price, really, that he had to consider. He would not only be collecting from one tax booth, now he would be collecting tax from all the booths in the Jericho area. He quickly accepted. The days went by quick enough, and Zacchaeus, in his new position, was pleased with the way things had gone, but as the days rolled by, he realized he had reached the peak in his world. He had hit the top of the world. There was nowhere more for him to go. He had always aimed for great wealth and position and power. He now had them, and he was dissatisfied. What he had been seeking was not really what he had been after, he discovered. And so we can now pick up the story in um, uh, Luke chapter 19. Actually, we won't go there just yet. We'll go to Matthew chapter 3. Because round about this time, it tells us, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert. I'm now in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who spoke of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare ye the way for the Lord. People that came through the gates, and uh, Zacchaeus was the first one to hear the local gossip and news as they came through the gates. And Zacchaeus heard about this John the Baptist. They were saying he might be the Messiah. This was the one that he'd learned about in school all those years ago. This could be the Messiah. And out of curiosity, more than anything else, Zacchaeus took time off work and went down to the Jordan River, where John the Baptist was baptizing. wasn't far from Jericho, about five miles. wasn't far for him to go at all. And so Zacchaeus went down there one day, and he loved what he heard. As he approached John, there was John the Baptist, not the sort of man that he was expecting, a man rather roughly clothed in very common sort of clothing, a man with a big beard and hair that hadn't been cut for a long time, but he had a booming voice and a certain amount of authority about him that Zacchaeus hadn't heard from a preacher before. And John the Baptist was preaching a, a repentance message, Scripture tells us, preaching against the ills and the, and the wickedness of society. And um, John the Baptist saw a, a group of priests, Pharisees and Sadducees standing there, and he really ripped into them. He said, you're nothing but a nest of snakes, a nest of vipers. I know what you get up to. You are dishonest. You are hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. You're meant to be the spiritual leaders of Israel, and you're nothing but a nest of vipers. Zacchaeus loved it. I could have told you that, John the Baptist. I've been saying that for years. I haven't been to church for years. It's exactly what I said. Zacchaeus went back to his tax-collecting booth and decided he wanted to hear more from John. And he went back down to Jericho, went down to the Jordan River on a number of occasions. And one day when he was there, someone asked the question, what about tax collectors? Well, that was him. And John the Baptist said, you are entitled to collect taxes and your commission, but you're not entitled to take any more than that. Be honest in your dealings. Someone else asked the question, what about soldiers? The two soldiers that were always with him, they had to protect him. He was a disliked man. They said, soldiers, you shouldn't take bribes. You shouldn't beat up on people just because you've got the power and authority of Rome behind you. And Zacchaeus went back, and if you read the chapter in Desire of Ages and the chapter in Zacchaeus, Ellen White tells us that at that point Zacchaeus realized he needed to change his life. He went back to his tax-collecting booth and stopped being dishonest. He had accepted the message of repentance and many times he went down and listened to John. He became a follower of John's. And then the day came when he was down there, and he was there that day. And John the Baptist was preaching against King Herod. He wasn't really a king, he was a tetrarch, but people sometimes called him king. King Herod, or 
tetric Herod, Herod Antipas, there are a number of Herods around about. Herod the Great was his father, died 4 BC. And his father had a number of sons, three of them who took over his kingdom. Herod Antipas was one of them. He had another brother called Philip. And Herod, went, Herod Antipas went to visit his brother Philip and quite liked the look of his wife. So much so that he uh, had an affair with her and decided he would kill his brother Philip so he could have her for his wife. So he did that. The Jewish people were outraged. King Herod was a, he was sort of a mongrel breed of Jew. He was an Edomite. They could sort of claim lineage to Abraham, but lots of heathen blood was mixed with him. The Roman people had put him on the throne, and they hated that. They hated the Edomites. He wasn't a proper Jew and they hated the way that he was flaunting his adultery in front of them. John the Baptist decided to preach against that this day, and his usual powerful way condemned King Herod for what he was doing. He should put away his wife, who was actually his niece. What he was doing was completely wrong. Herod wasn't there, but he heard about it. The next day he sent his soldiers down, and John the Baptist was arrested. You know that story, and that's another story. Eventually, John was killed. He was beheaded. Zacchaeus heard about that, and he was distressed. He had started a spiritual journey. Now, where was he going to go? He was a, he was a follower of John's. Even though he had started to reform his life, there were still things. He didn't feel he'd arrived. There was something missing. And then he began, began to hear news coming through the, through the gates. Jesus of Nazareth. He'd heard about Jesus of Nazareth. He'd even been through Jericho a number of times before, but he hadn't taken much notice of him. He was a follower of John's. He was placing his hope that John might be the Messiah. Now this Jesus, he'd heard great things about him, great miracles, and he'd heard that Jesus was on his way to Jericho. This might be his chance. He would see if he could see him. And on the day that uh, it was rumoured that he was coming, he could see a cloud of dust in the distance walking towards Jericho. There must be a great crowd of people to raise that much dust, he thought. This must be Jesus. And he left his tax collecting desk and, uh, raced, out and, and uh, raced out into the countryside there without really thinking what he was doing. He got close to the crowd there and suddenly realised the crowd was big. He was short. He was never going to see Jesus. And then he remembered he had just passed a sycamore tree on the way out here. They had the habit of long, growing, long, low branches. And he remembered there was a branch right over the road. He could run back and he could climb into that tree and he would have an elevated view of who was coming past. He did that and he waited, clambered up the tree in a rather undignified way and sat in the tree waiting, hoping no one would even see him, I suppose, not really thinking about it. And there the crowd came closer and as he looked at the crowd, he looked at someone who might be Jesus. He didn't really know what he looked like, so he was looking for a well-dressed person, maybe a big person of military-type capabilities, maybe a kingly-looking person. And he looked around, and he saw people in the crowd that sort of fitted that description, but he could tell they weren't the leader of this group. And then his eyes set upon a man of average looks, of average build with average clothes on. But there was no doubt about it, this was the leader of the group. This was Jesus that he had been looking for. And as the crowd got closer, Zacchaeus suddenly realized he didn't really have a plan. All he had a plan was of seeing Jesus. But as Jesus got close to him, he stopped right beneath the tree, looked up into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down from that tree because I need to come to your house. Wow, that was much more than Zacchaeus had ever imagined. He didn't imagine that Jesus would want to come to his house. He only wanted to see him or at best talk to him. And then Zacchaeus' heart leapt for joy because he saw standing right beside Jesus someone that he knew. His name was Levi. Levi Matthew. He remembered him. He was a tax collector up in Capernaum. They had had crossed paths before in their duties as tax collectors. Jesus had one of his close helpers who was a tax collector. There could be hope for him. The crowd began to mumble as Zacchaeus came out of the tree. Does Jesus really know who this is? 
This is the one at the bottom of the heap. The one below the prostitutes and the Samaritans. He's the worst of the worst. Notice when it's mentioned in Scripture, Jesus meets with sinners and tax collectors. They had their own special category. They were worse than anybody else. And as Jesus began to walk with Zacchaeus towards Jericho, the crowds began to drop away. They didn't want to be associated with Zacchaeus, tax collector. And by the time they reached the house of Zacchaeus, there was only Zacchaeus, his two guards, and Jesus' disciples left. Zacchaeus knocked on the door. Quickly it was opened by his servants. It was a palatial place that you might expect from one of the wealthiest people of Jericho. A quick nod and a wave of the hand and a brief word and servants scurried everywhere. Some to prepare the main meal for the day, some to bring out water to wash the feet, some to get some appetizers of uh, dried fruit and nuts. And they sat down to commune in a Middle Eastern way. Feet were washed, food was eaten, and then they waited for the main meal. This was the time that Jesus had been waiting for. There are three steps to salvation that we need to take. The first one is the law. Paul tells us that the law of God is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. We look at the law and we see the perfect character of God and we measure ourselves up against it and we know we are lost sinners. There is no way we can ever reach that standard and that's the standard we need to reach heaven. And we throw ourselves down before the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I am a sinner. Measured against your law, I am nothing. Measured against your character, I am nothing. Please forgive me. The second step is being granted forgiveness and realizing that we have been forgiven. And the third step is getting up off your knees, realizing that Jesus has placed his robe of righteousness on you and by faith accepting that and walking a new life. There is a fourth step but it's not part of salvation. It's the fruit of those three steps and that is improving your behaviour. Reformation. The first three steps though are exclusive to righteousness by faith. Zacchaeus had done the first step. He from John's preaching, a preaching of repentance, he had realised he was a sinner. But he'd hopped to the fourth step and he'd tried to, uh, feeling, trying to rearrange his life and, and, and trying to, by behaviour, by good works, hoping that God would accept him. He was a sinner. He was doing good works to make himself right with God. That's how he had learned it in the Jewish religion. But somehow it didn't feel right and so Jesus began to explain to him, Zacchaeus, this is how it works. And Jesus was straight up with him. This was one week before the crucifixion. He said, Zacchaeus, when I leave Jericho... I'm going to walk here from Jericho to Jerusalem and this time next week I'm going to be crucified on a cross. <clears throat> Zacchaeus said, how can this be? I learned that, and if I accept you as a Messiah, you're going to be the great one that's going to kill the Romans and chase them out of our land and make us a great nation. And Jesus said, that's not the way it's going to be, Zacchaeus. I am the Son of God and I am the Lamb of God and I am going to die for your sins. Suddenly it made sense to Zacchaeus. The lamb that he had seen slain at the temple there, it all now made sense. That represented Jesus, the Son of God, who was now in his house. Zacchaeus couldn't believe that God would be so great to do this, that he would pay the price for his sins and that he would go out of his way to come into his house to tell him about it. And Zacchaeus, by faith, accepted it. And out of excitement and exuberance, he said, I accept what you have done, Lord, and I'm going to give half of my goods away, and anybody that I have been dishonest with, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. That was the extreme measure. When people did wrong, there was a Mosaic law that you had to repay them a certain amount. Sometimes it was twice, sometimes three times. Four, four times was the extreme amount. Zacchaeus says, I'm going to pay the extreme amount. And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, this day salvation has come to this house. You have found salvation today, Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus knew now that that's what he had been looking for over all those years, how he had tried, to, he had tried with wealth and, and power and position. 
and even good works. But until he realized that his sins were forgiven and was willing to accept the robe of Jesus' righteousness, everything else was nothing. Jesus left Zacchaeus' house and he continued on his trip to Jerusalem, stopping at Bethany at his favorite friend's house, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Zacchaeus' work was not finished, though. He'd made a promise. That night he sat up late going through his record books, working out all the people that he had been dishonest to. Right at the top of the list there was Benjamin. All those years ago that he had paid Benjamin back for what he had done to him. And they made a list out with his treasurer that night, all the people that he might be able to find still living in Jericho. And early the next morning, before anyone went to work, knocked on the door of Benjamin. Benjamin came to the door looking rather dishevelled. He knew who Zacchaeus was. And with a scowl on his face, asked him what he wanted. Zacchaeus said, I did you wrong all those years ago. I took an extra silver coin off you. I'm now here to say sorry and ask your forgiveness and repay you for what I've done. Here is four silver coins. Zacchaeus worked his way through the day, doing that to everyone that he could find out that he had done. Some people were not there. They were itinerant tradespeople that came through Jericho. He would see them in months to come. Some perhaps he would never see again. Eventually, Zacchaeus had paid back everybody that he could, and there was still one obligation. He said, half of everything that I have left, I will give to the poor. He'd got rid of most of his ready cash. He'd pay people back fourfold. He now had to sell his house so that he could get half of what he had left to the poor. Can you imagine the rejoicing in Jericho that day and preceding days as Zacchaeus gave out gold and silver and copper coins to all the poor people in Jericho from the proceeds of the sale of his house? Indeed, salvation had come to his house that day. Jesus went on up to Jericho and during that Passion Week, stories came back to Zacchaeus again sitting at the tax collector's desk. Zacchaeus remembered Jesus had told him next week, Passover, they will crucify him. And the stories were coming back that Jesus was being accepted as a hero down there. Palm Sunday, people were wanting to make him king and and then the next day would come back how they wanted to stone him. And Zacchaeus realized the fickle nature of the people, so the Jewish people and people in general. Then on Friday, late Friday afternoon, as the last traveler came back from Jerusalem, through Jericho's gates before it closed for the night, one of the travelers said, we passed by Golgotha this morning. And Jesus was still alive, but he was nailed to a cross. And Zacchaeus then realized that what Jesus said was true, but maybe he wouldn't go through with it. But at three o'clock that afternoon, Friday afternoon, they looked up towards the hills. They could see where Jerusalem was. You couldn't see it from Jericho, but you could see 15 miles away. And he could see the dark thunder clouds up there. And he could hear the thunder. And he certainly saw the flash of lightning. And he wondered what on earth had happened up in Jerusalem that afternoon. He couldn't wait till Sunday morning to find out exactly what had happened. No travellers came through on Sabbath. Sunday morning, the very first traveller that came through, Zacchaeus could not wait to ask, what happened up there on Friday afternoon? And the traveller told him, Jesus, the one who people thought was going to be the Messiah, was crucified and he died on the cross at three o'clock in the afternoon. They took him and they put him in a grave. And this morning the city's in an uproar because the grave is empty. He's not there anymore. All sorts of rumours around about what's happened to him, but people are saying that he's risen, that he was indeed the Son of God. And Zacchaeus just smiled quietly to himself. And inner peace flooded over him. Sadness that his people had killed the Son of God but elation that God had paid the penalty for his sin. This morning, as we have contemplated the life of Zacchaeus, each one of us can fit into that story somewhere. You might be the Zacchaeus whose main ambition in life is to be wealthy, to be powerful, to be important. 
You might be the Zacchaeus that's started on the road to salvation, realizing you're a sinner, but not quite sure how to get there. Or you may be a sinner that's realized that Jesus is your Savior, and all you need to do is to accept him in his robe of righteousness and right this day. Jesus can say to you the same as he said to Zacchaeus, this day salvation has come into your life because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your saviour, as the substitute for your sin, and you can live eternity with you, with him. And I pray that that will be your aim today as we finish. Thank you. Do we have a hymn this morning to, to finish with? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the messages that you have given to us in Scripture. We thank you that you injected yourself into humankind, into human kind uh, race, and that you cared so much that you came down here to save us. And just like Zacchaeus, Lord, each one of us can have salvation enter into our hearts today. Today is the best day, Lord. And for those that have not made the decision, may that be their consideration this morning. 
so that they can say, it is well with this soul, I pray in Jesus' name.